This is the Daily Dispatch podcast with your business correspondent, Ted Keenan. Today, Dispatch Live is talking to uh, David Butler from Butler Attorneys. You're an East London man, old Selbornian, studied at Rhodes, and you are an attorney. Are that's we right. correct in that? Yeah, that's right. Attorney practicing in East London for the last 11 years, uh, practicing for my own account, uh, and a few hiring a, ca- a conveyancer, an attorney, and two candidate attorneys, yeah. Okay, we're discussing today one of probably the thorniest issues for landlords, probably more household landlords than commercial landlords, and that is the problem of tenants just not paying. What are the recourses that these people have? Ted, thank you. Yeah, well, the, the first recourse <coughs> is always try stop the rot. I mean, try and get the tenant... Uh, out of the lease premises. So on that front, one can bring an eviction application, uh, eviction application or an eviction action. Now, one would have to distinguish between, firstly, is it a residential property that's being let or is it a commercial property which is being let? Commercial, a little bit easier. One could even go to the High Court and seek an urgent application, so reduce the time frame in in obtaining an eviction. With a residential uh, property, it's not as simple. One has to comply with legislation, in particular prevention of illegal eviction from an unlawful occupation of land act, which is quite a mouthful, but basically it's referred to as the Power Act. Okay. I've spoken to quite a few landlords and they believe that the power actually lies with the tenant, irrespective of the ten- whether the tenant is paid or not. The tenant is in charge. Are they correct in this? Well, there is certain hoops that a landlord would have to jump through in terms of uh, the Act, the Power Act. Uh, But what it really sets out is evictions must be just and equitable. So the court will have a discretion in determining whether, firstly, the eviction is just and equitable, and secondly, when would be a just and equitable date for eviction. In doing so, they'll take into certain factors like the age of the tenants, if there's young children or old people, uh, the amount of rear rental that is owing Um, Yeah, and just basically determine uh, just an equitable date, which is not always an immediate eviction. So they can take those factors into account and and basically assist the tenant in staying in the property. So the rumours almost of people taking the roof off, taking the doors off, taking the windows out, are not actually lawful? It's it's not lawful. Um, it, It may have the desired effect, but there is a risk to that because... Uh, a person in possession of something, even if that possession is unlawful, like your tenant who's not paying rent, can approach the court and obtain what they call a spoliation order to restore possession. The landlord is then at risk uh, of paying a cost order. You know, so, so it wouldn't be advisable that, that they take the law into their own hands because then there is recourse for the tenant. So when somebody approaches your firm and says, I cannot get money out of the person that is renting my property. Yep. What advice do you give them? Well, there's, there's obviously more options, more legal options that or tools that are available to uh, a landlord. And one goes back even as far back as the, the Roman times. There's a, a landlord's hypothec, which uh, forms part of our common law, knowing that our common law uh, is based on Roman Dutch law. It's one of the things that, have, that has followed through. And basically, the landlord's hypothec is security for payment of rent. All the movable property that's found at the lease premises is or can be used as security for payment of rent. Just explain movable property. Is that property that belongs to the tenant rather than stuff that the landlord has got in there? Yeah, well, that would be the property of the tenant, uh, but also the landlord's hypothetic takes it further, and it can even... Subject to a few exceptions, but even property of third parties can be attached and uh, and sold in execution of uh, or to to recover a rear rental. So So if somebody's got a garage full of stuff, whether it belongs to the the tenant or belongs to friends of the tenants, that can go. Correct, correct. That that is the security and the far-reaching nature of of a landlord's hypothetic. Like I said, there are a few exceptions, but, uh, you know, it's... It, the, the principle is there that a third party's property can be uh, used as security for payment of rent, correct. What sort of costs are involved in that? If somebody comes to you, aside from the, the, act, the, the price of the actions that you're going to take, 
What other costs are involved? Yeah, so I think before we get to the costs, I just need to clarify that a landlord's hypothetic not only is common law, but it's also been entrenched in terms of the Magistrates' Court Act. So one can approach the Magistrates' Court, and there's two routes you can go. One, you can go and issue what they call a rent interdict summons, whereby the sheriff would go and attach the property, judicially attach it, while he is serving the summons. So he'll write up an inventory of uh, basically all the movable property at the property. Now, that part won't carry such a big cost because it's merely just uh, an attendance. The second way you can go is bring a freestanding application for attachment of the property separate from the summons and use the mechanisms in the magistrate's court rules to actually remove the property. But once you remove the property, you're going to be incurring additional sheriff's costs. So that's generally around about 100 odd rand a day. So if the process takes three months to get a judgment and then you can sell the property in relation to the judgment, you're looking at around about 10 grand just in sheriff's costs. That's apart from the... uh, the, the attorney's costs involved, yeah. Can we just digress for a second from the legal action? A lot of people have peop- have tenants that will just not get out, and 10 grand might in fact be cheap to just get them out of their hair. Well, yes. I mean, whilst, whilst the premise of bringing such an application uh, to immediately remove the property is that the landlord suspects the tenant may very well leave the premises and remove the property to frustrate payment of rent. Often is the case is once the property has been, or the movable property has been removed from the premises uh, or the lease premises, the tenant very seldom want to hang around. What would they be hanging around for? So the question is, uh, would you succeed in, in achieving your objective? Possibly. You know, possibly that once you take the property out, uh, the, the tenant won't want to hang around. And when he doesn't hang around, what's the next step? So he gets in his car, off he drives, what does the landlord do then? Well, once, once he's vacated the, the, mo- the immovable property, there's no eviction required. He's left the property, one can then re- re-tenant the property. But what you would have to do from a legal perspective is a landlord's hypothetic is only a security. So you would have to carry on, issue summons, and get your, uh, get your judgment in relation to the area rental, and then one can sell the property that's under attachment to cover the area rental. Often is the case, though, once you've made this move, I mean, law is not always about judgments and, uh, and, and the firm fist of the law. Often the tenant might very well come uh, cap in hand and say, okay, I've, I'm sorry I've been obnoxious and arrogant and wanting to stay in the property, but now... I actually want my stuff back. Can we not bring into into arrangements? I'll leave the property amicably. I will uh, pay 500 rand or 1,000 rand a month in, in liquidation of the area rental. But please, can I get my property back? Then, you know, a tenant uh, and landlord might, might have a meeting of the minds and, uh, and negotiate a, a smooth exit of the property. There are tales about people that refuse to move. They claim poverty, yet there's a flash motor car parked outside. What is the worst case scenario of trying to get those people out? Because they can claim to be penniless, but they're not. I I find your worst case scenario comes in particularly when uh, there's no written lease agreement in place. When there's no written lease agreement, it's a lot easier for a, can I call it like a professional debtor, professional tenant that wants to frustrate a landlord to shift his version and frustrate the landlord uh, in, in application proceedings. One might not even be able to get an eviction order in, in such circumstances. But, I mean, worst case scenario, uh, you're looking at, at a, generally speaking, about six months uh, to, to secure a opposed eviction. Um, it can be worse, uh, depending on, the, obviously, the discretion of the court. Best case scenario probably around two months to secure uh, a eviction, yeah. Have you had cases of a landlord approaching a tenant and saying, look, I'm going to actually pay you to get out here, so I'm scrapping your three or four months that you haven't paid because it's to my advantage to actually pay you some money to move? I I have, uh, well, it's not so much a payment but a writing off of the debt. We have have negotiated those sort of uh, settlements as well. Um, but then, you know, even some landlords would try that and the, 
And the tenant still tries to 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 be uh, arrogant and says, "No, I'm not even going to accept that. I'm just going to stay here." You know. So then, unfortunately, this uh, is a problem which requires a legal solution. One, one a landlord can't merely approach court and uh, and and deal with this on his own. But it also is one which is somewhat of a it's a game of legal chess. Uh, you know, you would need a, a property law specialist to to advise on the various options. You know, there's the landlord's hypothetic, the interdict, uh, the uh, the eviction proceeding. So to choose the right move for the particular set of circumstances, uh, it's it's advisable that the landlord approaches a attorney who specialises in property law. From the case of a stubborn tenant who just refuses to do anything, what is the worst case scenario regarding legal penalties or perhaps even criminal action against a person like this? Um, legal penalties, you know, the, 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 the penalty in legal proceedings is a cost order, uh, a cost order against the tenant, that, that would be the, the penalty, but... One can't draw blood from a stone. Uh, obviously, if he doesn't have anything to pay, you you basically, as a landlord, are unfortunately going to have to ca- carry those costs and seek to recover perhaps many years down the line, unless uh, you, you think it's throwing good money after bad and you might just, just give up the fight in terms of chasing the money. Uh, and so far as criminal proceedings are concerned, um, the only thing that comes to mind is where there is a judicial attachment of uh, property by way of or rent into six summons, if the tenant then leaves the premises, once he leaves the premises, unfortunately, you lose your judicial attachment once the property moves from that premises. Uh, but he will have been in contempt of court because the sheriff would have advised him uh, that you are not to remove this property, it's to remain under attachment pending finalisation of this uh, action. And uh, so there would be uh, contempt of court proceedings that are a landlord could bring against him, but it doesn't carry a very severe penalty. I mean, it, I think it's six months in prison or a 300 rand fine. So if you could pay a 300 rand fine, it's not a very uh, big, big penalty. If an inexperienced landlord, perhaps a young person who's had to move out of his own house because of his constrained financial circumstances, perhaps staying now with his parents or that, if a person like that approached you, aside from the legal aspect, what would you advise them to do to check out a prospective tenant? So your landlord, yeah, I mean, you would, you would want to firstly get consent to run uh, credit checks. That's, that's a starting point. Um, if there are any references that you could get from uh, the tenant when, when meeting with the tenant and in effectively interviewing the tenant, uh, that would be a good starting point. But obviously you can't run credit checks without a consent. You see when someone has, has the propensity to fall in arrears, one would fear that he'll have the propensity to fall in arrears with the landlord. So that's where I would start, yeah. Is there any limit on what you can take as an advance payment? Could you take the rent times three months? You can. Or is that, I don't, is I don't that purely in your... I think it's a it's, it's a contractual arrangement, so it's uh, it's up to the parties. I think it's it's very nice for a landlord if they're able to get three months. Uh, it's not the norm. The norm is is generally your one month uh, deposit, which is generally a damage deposit, but it can, in terms of a written lease agreement, be used to satisfy a, a rear rental. So a three month is is good, um, but it's not often affordable. Bearing in mind that it, it might be uh, significant. Drawing a police agreement, would you advise people to use a person like yourself to make it tight? 100%, yeah. I mean, you, you would want a solid lease agreement in place. And as I've said, if you don't have a written lease agreement in place, you, uh, you f- may sign yourself in, in trouble as well. Another aspect in terms of a written lease agreement is it's not all doom and gloom for the tenant. The tenant does, in terms of the Consumer Protection Act, have the right to cancel a lease on 20 business days' notice. However, you want to include in the lease as a landlord now a reasonable cancellation penalty. So if you don't have a reasonable cancellation penalty contained in the lease, then you can't charge any cancellation and a tenant can actually get out on 20 business days notice, um, get out of the lease and vacate the property uh, and now you might find yourself with an unleased premises. So generally speaking, a month has been found to be a reasonable cancellation penalty to find a new 
uh, a new tenant and perhaps any wasted uh, agents commissions that that might have been incurred in leasing the premises yeah david aside from all the legal side do you think that this is having an impact on the rental market where people are looking at this saying well, i'm not going to actually buy a property and rent it because there's too many pitfalls here yeah possibly um the the pitfalls are if the the tenant falls into arrears you know the bond maintainment the bond payments have to be maintained the uh the house still needs to be maintained one still has to service what is possibly an ever increasing uh, municipal account and uh and yeah so whilst the tenant might be battling it's there's a knock on effect to the to the landlord so one must be prudent when when buying these investment properties as to can i as a landlord uh, manage the risk i need to have a little bit of a bankroll to be able to manage the risk of uh, of letting property as an investment your final advice to a young person who is considering renting his property out aside uh, from don't do it no i think it's i think it's definitely something that uh, that is a worthwhile investment uh, but my advice would be you know to consult a uh, a property law uh, attorney um someone that specializes in property law and just uh, understand what you're getting into and and set yourself up uh in the best way that you don't you don't find problems down the line set up right from the beginning when it comes to the lease agreement when you have a, a difficult tenant don't don't put your head in the sand and approach the attorney to see how quickly we can deal with it because you know once you you start the process uh there is a process that may, that may need to be followed it's also somewhat of a game of uh, of legal chess so you would need uh, an attorney that that understands the the, the property game and understands what solution may be best for your particular set of circumstances. David Butler, thank you for all the advice. David Butler of Butler Attorneys. I appreciate it. Thank you.